It's five o'clock on Friday, five o'clock Pacific time. And tonight we're going to be sort of addressing the question, what is so great about pot still Irish whiskey? All righty. Hey, uh, I want to thank everyone who turns tunes in early. You know, um, when you first start going live, there's a fear that you're going to be sitting there with no one to talk to. So you, uh, in the early days of live streaming, what you tend to do is just start talking, pretending somebody's there and hope somebody, uh, somebody tunes in. So eventually when you have developed a pattern, which people know you're going to go live, Hey, it's Friday night, Eric's going live. Uh, and people show up early, sometimes 15 minutes early, sometimes a half an hour early, and people are already talking amongst themselves. Um, it sends a huge message to me that people value what I'm doing. They like to get getting together, you know, um, in this pub, <laughs> in a sense. And uh, I like to tune in to not only hang out with me, listen to what I have to say about whiskey, uh, but to hang out with fellow uh, other fellow uh, whiskey enthusiasts. So I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in early. An absolutely uh, beautiful day here in California. Let me see if I can uh, say hello to some of the, the early birds who tuned in. Absolutely beautiful day here. 70 degrees, California, sunny. There's no humidity. Uh, all the smoke is gone, at least here where I'm at. And just clear blue skies, perfect weather. I went on a bike ride today. Uh, I live out in the Sonoma wine country. So, you know, right down the road from my house, the St. Francis. I went by St. Francis, um, Chateau Saint-Jean, and uh, Kenwood, and just, you know, going along the, the vineyards out there. Harvest hasn't been completed yet. It's kicked off. So you see the lovely grapes. You can, this time of year, at harvest time, you can smell the grapes in the air. Harvest has already begun. Some of the wineries are already pressing the grapes. So you get that smell in the air. It is absolutely enchanting. I know this is a whiskey channel, not a wine channel, but it is absolutely enchanting to be out there. And I'm just so, so happy to be in my in this new house, in this new digs. And we talk about whiskey out in the wine country. So uh, Paul M., thanks for uh, tuning in. IC86, thanks for tuning in. Mike Bennett, uh, sir, now that it's cooling off, I need to send you some uh, a sample of a whiskey. Uh, we did that private live stream uh, a little while back. Now that's cooled off, I think it's safe to ship. Um, I have some other stuff I need to ship for future live streams. Going to do a live stream with Ed O'Meara from um, Rod Cut Review. We're going to talk about Conamara. So I need to send him some samples. So I'm going to be sending a bunch of stuff in the mail. Uh, Super Kitty, thanks for <laughs> tuning in. <coughs> Excuse me, Jim Morris, uh, thanks for tuning in. Grumpy Old Fart, thank you much for tuning in. I got to laugh every time I see that. So, alrighty. So, uh, we're talking about uh, pot still Irish whiskey. Uh, a lot of designations or classifications of whiskey lack a little clarity, right? And so they need a lot of explaining. When you talk about, for example, in scotch, talk about a single malt scotch whiskey, the single doesn't refer to the malt. The single refers to the distillery. It's just one distillery. The malt, you can malt all kinds of grains, right? But the best for malting is, of course, barley. So really you're talking about single distillery malted barley, and it's from Scotch whiskey, right? So if they were to really put what that name means fully in there, it'd be a lot longer, right? It'd be a single distillery malted barley Scotch whiskey. Well, the same thing goes with pot still and pot still whiskey. Well, you either have a pot still or you have a column still. So a lot of the whiskeys, you know, single malts from Ireland are done in a pot still. Why aren't they called a pot still? Well, there's a history behind that. Uh, the nomenclature as to what a pot still whiskey doesn't really reflect uh, what is actually what a pot still whiskey is. It's, un it's unclear. So we're going to go over the definition, a little bit of history. We're going to go over the definition of a pot still whiskey. I'm going to talk about these that I have here. Um, and I'm, there's a couple distilleries, one in Colorado. I can't remember the other one here in the United States that are doing a pot still, uh, style of whiskey, uh, doing an ode to, 
uh, uh, Ireland here in the United States. I haven't tried them yet, uh, but I would like to. Hey, uh, G-Man, thanks for uh, tuning in, man. So another thing about whiskey or we talk about music, we talk about food, whatever region or place you're talking about, I like to say, what does this region do really, really, really well? What is the best from this region? Whether you're talking about wine or whiskey, what is then the best that that particular producer um, produce? You know, to have a fair representation of the potential of a region or a style, you got to try the best. Even if they're insanely expensive, at least once in your life, Try it. Yeah, it's not your, your, you're going to be your normal go-to because it's too damn expensive. But to truly understand the potential of a region, you want to buy it, you buy it. So, for example, there's uh, a wine I bought from China. It came out of the Himalaya Mountains. Could China produce quality wine? This bottle of wine was $300. Insanely expensive. I can get second growth Bordeaux uh, for $125, $150 bucks on release. $300. Bucks. So I spent the money, the $300, not because I was expecting a, a high-quality $300 wine. I just want to know if this is the best they've got, then I want to try it. So for an academic purpose, I spent the 300 bucks, and it was a very good wine. Uh, but I could get a lot of second-growth Bordeaux for $125, $150 for half the money. But at least it let me know what is the potential that some regions in China have for producing wine. Well, the same thing goes for whiskeys as well. Um, what we, but Most of us are probably big uh, Scotch fans or maybe some bourbon fans, but uh, when we look at Ireland, a somewhat forgotten, and yet the oldest, as we're going to see, whiskey region, uh, Jim, Jim Ingram and I, a couple weeks ago, went live, we had kind of referred to Ireland as being sort of this puberty stage, you know, it's, or, it's, or it's sort of being resurrected. It's sort of resurging. And so they went from three distilleries now to 30 plus distilleries. And so now it's in a sort of awkward stage because it doesn't have a lot of maturity yet. Okay. But in the meantime, what is the best that they're producing? What is the best that they have to offer? What really reflects Ireland's best? So if you're going to have a perception, if you've had one Irish whiskey and you're kind of like, meh, well, have you tried these? Have you tried a pot still whiskey? Have you tried the best of pot still whiskeys coming out of Ireland? If you haven't had that, and if you sort of turn your nose up at Ireland, you go, screw Ireland. I'm going to drink my scotch. I'm going to drink my bourbon. Then I'm going to challenge you, give these a try. Give these a try and see what's unique and distinctive about them. Um, and not only in terms of um, what these individual producers are releasing, but in terms of this style of whiskey. Hey, Whiskey Straight Al, speaking of Ireland, uh, thanks for uh, tuning in, man, and thanks for uh, staying up late. It is 5 o'clock here, but it's probably around 1 o'clock uh, uh, his time uh, right now. So, alrighty, let's get into this. I'm going to start off first with a short little video. It's an hour. It's an hour. It's a, <laughs> it's a minute and 15 seconds. It's a very sort of brief summary of the history of, of Irish whiskey, just sort of an introduction, uh, not going super deep. And uh, here we go. The history of Irish pot still whiskey. Whiskey has been distilled in Ireland since at least the 1400s and most likely as early as the sixth century. Single pot still whiskey emerged as a means of avoiding a tax introduced in 1785 on the use of malted barley. Although this tax was repealed in 1855, the popularity of the style endured until the emergence of blends in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the 19th century, single pot still whiskey was the most popular style of whiskey in the world and formed the bulk of Ireland's whiskey exports. However, with the rise of cheaper, milder or blended whiskies in the 20th century, single pot still whiskey declined in popularity and many, formerly all pot still brands, changed their production to become blends. By 1980, only two specialist bottlings remained in existence, Green Spot and Redbreast, with one in danger of being discontinued. 
However, in recent years, a resurgence in whiskey distilling in Ireland has led to the launch of several new single pot still Irish whiskies. I'm muted. Sorry. You know what? Roy, Roy's live stream. I'm going to start all over again. I got it. I got it. I muted the sound while the video was playing. I got it. Sound. You got it. All right. Sorry. It's funny. This happened with, this happened with Roy. Roy did a, a live stream. Aquavite did a live stream from Ar Ardnakamurkin. I know I just screwed up the pronunciation. Ardnakamurkin. Ardnakamurkin. If they wanted us to pronounce it correctly, they would have spelled it the way an American can spell, read, uh, spell it. All right. So let me back up. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, when we turned out. So I muted it while the video was playing because I didn't want to be playing it around. All right. Start over again. Okay. Man, now I got to remember what. Okay. All right. We backed up. Okay. If you're going to study a particular region or try a particular region, I think you need to try the best from that particular region uh, to rightly represent. Even if you're going to spend more money, it has to, I think if you're going to judge a region in terms of what its capabilities are, you need to try the best. And sometimes that means spending extra money. A bottle of wine from China, because China, can China produce high quality wines? Yes. I spent $300 on a bottle of wine from China. It was actually coming from the Himalaya Mountains, a uh, Cabernet, uh, Cab Franc, I don't know, Cab Franc uh, Merlot blend. It's about 300 bucks. Not because I thought it would be worth 300 bucks, but because I wanted to see what is the potential of this, the best that they're releasing. I want to try it. I spent 300 bucks. It was very good. Qualitatively equivalent to a second growth of Bordeaux. But I can get a second growth Bordeaux on release for about 125 bucks. So it costs twice as much as a second growth Bordeaux. Would I go and buy another one? No, of course not. But at least I know China has the ability to produce high quality wines. All right. Now they just need to make them affordable. Um, same thing goes for whiskeys. If you're a Scotch snob and you're sticking your nose up at Irish whiskey, I'm going to ask you, have you tried uh, a single pot still Irish whiskey. Not just any single pot still, but have you tried the ones that I'm going to talk about tonight? All righty. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Whiskey Straight Out says, you look like you had forgot to put your teeth in. <laughs> no, I'm just doing a, it's a, just a, doing a live stream brain fart. I, so d while playing the video, I was pouring this and I didn't want to be clinking around uh, while the vi while the video was uh, going, so I muted it, and then stupid me. Even though the mic is over, the mic is right here, blinking at me, it just brain fart. Next time, I ain't gonna do it just in case. All right. Anyway, so um, we can get snobbish about our whiskeys. We can go, uh, hey, but I can get this single malt Scotch for this, All right? Um, you know, it's funny thing is now I'm trying to remember what I haven't said, what I said during the whole time I was muted. So if I'm repeating myself. Sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> um, if you're going to judge a particular region in terms of its capability, you need to try the best of what they got. All right. What is the best P 
Pinot Noir that California can produce? What's the best Cabernet Sauvignon? What's the best whiskey that Texas can produce? And when you're producing a whiskey or producing a wine, you need to figure out what you can do best where you're at, what makes you distinctive and stand out and what really reflects your place. You know, if you are a big fan of um, bourbon, but you live in a place that's too cool and you're not going to get the proper interaction between the oak and the spirit because you're in a, a, a cold region, and but you really need to have a better impact on that bourbon, maybe you need to do something else. And, you know, there are some California bourbons, so some here at, coming out of Sonoma. I haven't tried, all of them seem to be way too young unless you're willing to sit on it for 20 years, right? Um, but you're talking about new oak, new charred oak, and you're, you're going to want a greater extraction. There's a reason why bourbon does well in Kentucky. The more extreme fluctuations in temperature, the highs and lows that you're not going to have in California. Same goes for, say, like Texas, right? Then you have to sort of mitigate, say, in Texas, some reasons of Texas to not sort of overdose. You have too much uh, angel share and, and too much harshness coming out of the wood, but that's a different kind of um, issue with, with the region. But if you're going to s judge a particular region or that particular style of whiskey or what they have to offer, I think you need to see what they do best. And when I had uh, Jim Engram on, we were talking about single malts and it was generally recognized that single malts, uh, while there's some very good ones coming out of Ireland, it is not Ireland's best. Scotland, hands down, will beat Ireland in the single malt category. What Ireland does really, really well, and is what is unique to Ireland, but is now also now produced, being produced at a couple of distilleries here in the United States, is single pot Irish whiskey. Now, as you saw there, single pot Irish whiskey came out of a necessity or in a reaction to um, taxes. And so... Um, it, it, people developed a palette for it, a, a likeness of it, so that even when uh, the uh, there was a repeal uh, in 1855 of the taxes on malted barley, they continued to produce it. And it has become a style of whiskey that uh, not only reflects the history and culture of Ireland, but I think has something unique to offer to the palate, to the whiskey lover, so that there's going to be a time in which I am in the mood for a Irish pot still whiskey, not a bourbon, not a peated scotch, not a Japanese whiskey, and that's what I'm going to grab for. And so not only in terms of being a student of whiskey and wanting to understand pot still whiskey as a category, because it's, it's important if you're going to be a student of whiskey and have a worldwide perspective on whiskey, but just in terms of a category that I have come to really, really enjoy. So the best that I think that I've thus far tried, there are some representatives here. And I poured myself these three. So coming out of Middleton, which is on the south part of uh, Ireland, there's this spot series. There is a, a green spot, and then there's two other green spots um, with special cast finishing. There is the Chateau Montalena, which is finished in a Zinfandel cask. There is the Leoville Barton, or Barton, uh, finished in a Bordeaux cask, Cabernet Sauvignon. There is uh, the Yellow Spot, which is more on the dessert side, very citrus, tropical, uh, floral, uh, honeyed, uh, done with um, uh, fortified wine cask. This is more of a dessert for me. It's more of a dessert whiskey. These are two that I'm going to be um, reviewing in the series. This is the red spot. One of the finishings is a Marsala cask. This is absolutely spectacular. Uh, even before you see the review of it, I'll tell you right now, I know it's going to be very expensive, but if you can get your hands on this bottle, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. So it's sort of a preview before I actually do the review of it. Highly, highly, highly. It's a seven-year-old uh, it's done in uh, a Madeira cask, among others, oh, and just a, um, a bourbon cask. This is a bottle that I could easily kill really, really, really quick. That every time I go to look at my shelves, I'm going to want to grab it. So because it's expensive, I'm kind of be want to be judicious with it and be very, very, very careful with it. All right, we got a. Um, let's see, bring up the chats here. 
comments. Uh, Glenn Anderson, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know what that NLK. I'm not sure what that denomination is, but thank you very much. He says, we'll like to see a peated pot still. Interesting idea. I'm a big fan of peated whiskey, but I think there's a, I think there would be a problem with it. Um, if you're an Irish whiskey fan, and you see, I'm going to see if you you agree with me on that one. Um, so, as I like to say, every time a Glen Cairn rings, an angel gets his wings. Thank you very, very much. Here's the issue I would have with a peated pot still. Similar to actually some pros and cons to these and this, which is this. There's a distinctive Norwegian. Thank you very much. A Norwegian kroner. Thank you very much. So there is a distinctive aroma and flavor profile that a pot still whiskey provides. And I think you got to be real careful of not hiding that. Maintain the distinctiveness of what a pot still whiskey provides. It has a distinctive spice character to it. It has a distinctive creaminess to it. And so I think there would be a danger of covering up that, right? It's sort of like, you know, there are some women who, are, who are, have a natural beauty and then they put too much makeup on, right? They, they don't need to it. They don't need to put that much makeup on. You know, maybe a little eyeliner, a little bit of lipstick, but let's go easy on it, right? You know, you don't need to look like, uh, you know, a televangelist wife with, with the makeup. Chill out with the makeup. You have a natural beauty. You look great, honey. Back off on the makeup. You don't need to like, you went to a bakery and they just slapped on the icing, you know. You, you have a natural beauty, you know, let's go, let's go with it. Same thing with, I think, pasta whiskey. I think they have a natural beauty to them. Um, <laughs> Christopher Malloy says, my mouth's bleeding. He's drinking the Red Breast 12 cast drink, and then he says, my mouth's bleeding. I've not had that problem with their uh, Red Breast cast uh, strength. Anyway, so, I yeah, peated shortbread toffee. Yeah, Scott Rant, uh, Rant says, I, I think my my concern would be is you're covering up what's actually beautiful about pasta whiskey. But who knows? Maybe I could be surprised. Maybe I'd try it and say, wow, this is awesome. I don't know. I, that's just coming from theory. That's just from theory. I don't think one's ever been made. I don't know if it ever will be made. But I think Pete would probably lean better towards a uh, single malt. And me personally, I like the sherry cask combination. I like a sherry cask combination with Pete. Yes, bourbon casks are great. But um, or ex second fill, bourbon cask, whatever. Uh, but I like sherry. I like the sherry and Pete uh, combo. But that's just my personal preference. All right. Da -da -da. All right. It would be interesting. I'd be willing to try it. I'm always willing to try it. <coughs> but theoretically, I think it would it would cover it up. All right. So uh, I have here, I have, this is the Teeling Pot Still, um, which is probably the youngest out of all these. This is the Red Breast 12, I would say is the, the contender against all the other challengers. In fact, I would say against all the other styles, regardless of Irish whiskey, uh, the, the Red Breast 12. I also have the Lust Owl, which is a more sherry, uh, now night statement, um, uh, sherry cast finish, uh, a pot still, and I have the cast strength as well, but I just wanted uh, the baseline. This is the 12-year-old. Uh, and then this is the John Lane Powers. John Lane, Sherry Cast. This is very much a um, Sherry Bomb, and I really, really like it. And let's, but, but before we get into this, let's go over, let's cover a little bit the legal definition. Okay, what is a pot still whiskey? So there are pot stills, and there are um, column stills. Um, also known as a coffee still, which or a continuous still, same thing. Um, single malts are done in pot stills. So is a single uh, malt a pot still whiskey? No. For whatever reason, this style of whiskey got labeled a pot still, Irish pot still whiskey. And if it's done from one distillery, it's a single uh, uh, pot still Irish whiskey. I don't think the designation accurately describes the style of whiskey it is, but it is what it is. Single malt Irish whiskey also doesn't reflect what a single malt Irish whiskey actually is, because the single doesn't refer to the malt, 
it refers to the distillery. And the malt refers to barley. You can malt rye. You can malt corn. A little more challenging, but you can do it. You can malt wheat. So really a single malt Irish, excuse me, single malt Scotch whiskey is a single distillery malted barley Scotch whiskey. And we're going to find, just as that reflects a longer designation for the whiskey, so also does pot still Irish whiskey. So let's get into what is uh, da -da -da a pot still Irish whiskey. All righty. You know me, I like my slides and I like my notes. Now, all Irish whiskey has to be aged a minimum of three years in wood casks. It doesn't have to be oak, but it has to be a wood cask. Uh, it has to be a minimum of 40% alcohol by volume. Uh, so that applies to all Irish whiskeys. The primary difference between Irish whiskey then and Scotch whiskey is one uh, obviously, it's made in Ireland and not in Scotland. And secondly, uh, that they don't have to use oak. They can use other types of cast. Now, to distinguish single pot still Irish whiskey or just pot still Irish whiskey from all the other types of Irish whiskey, because all the other types of Irish whiskey essentially are parallel to the different types of Scotch whiskey, except Ireland doesn't have a legal category of uh, blended malt. Uh, Irish whiskey. There are three that I know of, the, of blended malts out there, but they're just not designated as blended malts because the category, the legal category doesn't exist. All right. So a single pot still Irish whiskey or pot still Irish whiskey is distilled from a mash of a combination of malted barley, unmalted barley. Most people remember that. It's this other part that people forget and other unmalted cereals. That tends to get forgotten. A lot of your Pot still Irish whiskeys don't have un other unmalted cereals, such as rye. They're only using malted barley and unmalted barley. And so we tend to forget that those, that unmalted cereals, uh, other old unmalted cereals are also allowable. Secondly, it's distilled in a pot still so that the distillate has the aroma and taste of um, materials used. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you would have to do a study of grain whiskey put through, or even barley whiskey put through a, a continuous still, which tends to be more highly rectified and it's produced faster to understand the differences between the mouthfeel and the aromas and flavors. Typically, you're going to get from a column still versus a pot still. So you would have to know what those differences are. Third, made with a minimum of 30% malted barley and 30% unmalted barley, right? So 60% has to be at least 60% barley, and then the rest could be other types of grains. But at least 30% of that barley has to be malted, and the last 30% of that has to be unmalted. For up to 5% of cereals other than malted or unmalted barley, such as oats, rye, may be used. Um, okay, so let me back up a little bit. So you could have, it has to be at least, excuse me, I screwed up there. It has to be at least 95% barley, 5% of other cereals can be used. But in the percentages of malted versus unmalted, you have to have at least 30% malted and 30% unmalted. So only 5% can be cereals other than barley. But the percentages of malted to unmalted has to at least be 30-30. All right. So of that 95%, of if you of bar, barley, if if uh, seven, 90 of it was malted, the, the, well, no, no, you couldn't do that. So the maximum, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the maximum that you could have of a malted barley, you know, I should have done this math before I got started. Uh, the maximum that you could have of malted barley then would be 65% because you'd have 65 malted barley, 30% unmalted barley, that would take you to 95%, and then the other 5% would be, I know I'm probably confusing people, the other 5% would be the other cereals. So the maximum percentage you can have of either malted or unmalted is 65%, and you have to have at least 30% of either one of them, or the maximum of 5% of other cereals. All right, I hope that made that clear, such as oats and rye. Uh, you don't see oats too often. Uh, typically, it's going to be wheat or rye. All right. 
if I added confusion, if you have any questions, let me know. Five, either double or triple distillation may be used. Some people think triple distillation is required. It's not. Although traditionally, most Irish pot still is triple distilled. And I'm, as I mentioned before, the term single can be added if the Irish pot still whiskey is distilled uh, on a site of a single distillery. All right. Um, fuck. No. Nope. Man, another technical error. Sorry about that. I uh, hope your, everything went all right on that. Uh, I had a difficulty getting that stupid image off the screen. All right. So, did I clear? Did everything come across clear? All right. So 95 has to be 95% has to be barley with at least 30% of unmalted and at least a 30% of malted. So the maximum you could have of either one is 65% because the other 30% still has to be of the other category. All right. Not a common last name. Oh, don't worry. All right. And then 5% of other types of cereals. I hope that clear, clears that up. Alrighty. Alrighty. So what is it that well summarized? Thank you very much. I should have done the whiskey math and put that in there. Uh, next time, I'm if I'm ever teaching on Irish whiskey again, to make it clear, what's the max? So, or it could be on an exam. What's the maximum amount of malted barley you can have, or what's the maximum amount of unmalted barley you can have in a single pot Irish whiskey? That would be an excellent quiz question, right? Because you'd have to go, okay, you got to have at least thirty percent of each. Uh, you got to have a maximum of um, the five percent of other cereals. All right. So there we go. All right, let's move on. So, um, -dum -bum -bum. so these are from Middleton. Teeling's from Teeling, although they also inherited uh, some spirit from their predecessor uh, at Cooley. Uh, Redbreast is also from Middleton, and Powers Lane is also from, if I recall correctly, someone correct me if I'm wrong, is also from. Uh, Middleton. Now, what is it that I really like about Irish pot still whiskey? Why would anyone, why would anyone in the United States want to imitate that? What, if you understand, other than it's some sort of gimmick thing, um, I think if you, if you understand what is appealing about uh, pot still whiskey and someone who has an appreciation for it, um, thank you very much. Every time a Glen Cairn rings, excuse me, an angel gets its wings. All right. They not only do they uh, get their angel share uh, out of the uh, cask room, uh, they also get uh, wings. All right. Whiskey Straight Out says that Powers John Lane is one of the best, uh, best value Irish whiskey. So. The Powers Lane, about 65 bucks. 65 bucks. It's bottled at, dun, 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 dun. it's non chill filtered, bottled at 46% alcohol by volume. Um, it is a, if you like sherry cask whiskeys, it is a, a pretty much a sherry bomb. Uh, I think it has a high quality price ratio. All right, let's start off with the tealing. Uh, the Tailing Pot Still Whiskey. Now, what I like about Pot Still Whiskey is texture. You know, it's typically said that Pot Still Whiskeys have a unique spice character to it. There is a buttery character to it. Um, Daniel and Rex refer to it as being like a butter cookie. I kind of, they remind me a little bit more of a reduced buttery sauce. Worth, but you're still in that buttery category, and it's something cooked, so in that category. I went and bought a box of butter cookies or biscuits or whatever, tried it, and it didn't remind me of an Irish whiskey, so I can't use that descriptor. So um, that spice is definitely there, that distinctive spice. Now, this is, of course, also aged in 
going by memory here. My brain, my brain, I just, oh, this is the pot still. Yeah, 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 pot still. Da -da -da -da. And I can't read the writing. I for, and I bloody forgot. Da -da 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 -da. Not your full third. Sun remembers. Put it in there. Our single pot still was crafted using a recipe of 50% unmalted barley and malted barley, 50, uh, triple distilled, matured in hand selected. Because you don't want to do feet selected. You want it to be hand selected. Hand selected, uh, cast. Man, the print is so damn small. Um, when we say it's ready, this is not how everyone... Man, the print is so damn small. Da -dun -da 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 -dun. I just got to see if somebody saved me and put it in there. All right. You know what? If, you can't, if the print is too damn small, here's what you do. You take your camera and you zoom in. And you use your camera on your phone as a, as, as a magnifying glass. All right. So it's 50-50 unmalted and malted barley. I should I sh I already reviewed this, so I should know this off the top of my head. And I should have reminded myself what the cat what the other casts were. So it's ex bourbon cast, and then they put it in. Da -da -da -dum. Did it actually just reunite lost relatives? I don't know. Hold on. Let's freaking look it up. I should have looked this up before I went live. Triple distilled. Enter. Okay. American virgin oak, bourbon, and sherry cast. American oak. Bourbon and sherry cast. All right, you know I. Sh you know what I should have done? I should have blind nosed it since I don't remember. See if I could figure out what it is, and then check the notes. And it would have been a good blind tasting test. All right, to see if I could figure out the cast. And it does have that hint, just a hint of that sherry note cask in there. But percent, but because the sherry note isn't. Like smacking up inside the and your upside the face, like the John um, Powers Lane, John Powers Lane, John Lane Powers Powers John Lane is, and and you look at the color of it, it's not as dark, so it doesn't have this uh, heavy sherry coloring there, and yet it's there. It's got a real nice cinnamon spice there, but nothing at this particular moment is telling me it's Irish and it's not Scotch or from somewhere else. But I do know it's either Scotch or Irish for this one thing alone. It doesn't have any new mate character to it. And it doesn't have that sort of overbearing smack in the face of extraction of oak. The way you would from a warmer region. So if you take a Scotch whiskey, the spirit, and you put it into a cask and put it in Texas or South Africa or Australia, there's an element that's going to remind you of a Scotch whiskey or a malt. And, and, but it's the, the the way in which the heavy extraction is out of the cask is going to tell you something about the climate. So this does tell me cool climate. And that's my way of thinking of things in terms of uh, coming from a wine background. This does speak cooler climate in terms of nature of extraction. It does tell me it's not super young because I'm not getting the green notes. I'm not getting those spirity notes. I'm not getting that character of um, a new make, but it does seem youthful. There's a slight tingling on the nose, but it's not overwhelming. Tell me it's probably under 50%. The multi character does really, really shine on this. That lets me know it's a, there is a malt in there. 
that's not say versus a blend in which um, a whiskey that's mostly a blended whiskey is going to have something other than malt, probably corn or wheat. So you're probably not going to get that distinctive malty character on the back on the back end. Immediately, immediate analysis of it could fool you into thinking it's a single malt. However, and this is the key point, texture, texture, mouthfeel. That is what I think, at least for me, really sells uh, pot still whiskey, Irish pot still. It's the texture. It's the mouthfeel, the smoothness, a creaminess, a velvetiness, right? A silkiness on the palate that really makes it seductive. Not just merely that I like it, but something that sort of draws me in to want to have another sip. On the palate, it comes across as youthful and yet without the new make notes. So if I'm if I was doing this blind, um, it seems youthful and yet not so youthful that I'm not getting any new mix character. It's that maltiness rings, but it's got a silky texture to it. So my 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 conclusions in, in terms of where I would be going with it, I would say it's either a blended whiskey with a high malt content, or it's a pot still, or the smoothness or the creaminess character of it could be with age, but it's showing youthfulness. So I, I would veer away from the age. So therefore, because a grain, because a blended whiskey using grain can also give that silky texture to it. So um, I do get a little bit of that buttery character to it, that distinctive buttery character to it, but it's not as intense as this next one, which we'll get into in a minute. In a minute. Um, and so it does have that leanings. It does have the clues there that it's a, uh, pot still Irish whiskey. Now, of course I know what it is. And so I, Eric, you're seeing that stuff just because you know what it is. How would you really do it if you're blind? That's what I'm going to be working on off, off screen is compare single malts versus pot stills to see doing blind to see how I could taste them. Speaking of blind tasting, uh, this morning I was on the phone with the founder of the Council of Whiskey Masters. Mostly I was talking to him. I was wondering about the structure of the Master of Scotch exams. Not the content, because obviously you can't tell me what the content is in terms of what types of questions, whatever, but the, basically the structure. So in case you don't know, most people know, I'm a certified sommelier, so I've studied with the Court of Master Sommeliers, taken exams with them, uh, went through the Winespray Educational Trust. They have a particular way of doing their exams. Um, I've never studied for the Institute of Masters of Wine, but I've done work for them. I know Masters of Wine. I've sat in on classes uh, for the, with the Institute of Masters of Wine, so I'm familiar with the structure and how the Institute of Master of Wine is run, similar to the WSET Diploma. So I was really curious and wanted to know what's the structure of the exams and how they do their exams. Um, and um, in order to rightly study, and what am I going to be expecting? Now, he's, he assured me, you're not going to walk in blind. We're going to tell you straight up the structure of the exams. You, here's the required reading. Here's what's expected. So it's not like you're going to just show up and go, oh, I don't know how I'm going to be tested, but somehow I've got to figure it out. No, they're going to tell you, once you are become a student for that particular level, they're going to tell you. But I wanted to know now, out of curiosity, I was, I'd was i been wondering in my head how they compared to these other organizations. And so that's basically what we talked about. Um, once I go through the examination process, which is going to take some time, their next exam is potentially in May 22 um, in Scotland uh, in front of a, a committee, uh, which I heard Charles McLean's going to be on the committee. Um, but I don't know if I'll be ready by May 22. We'll see, uh, but they didn't. They canceled the one they're going for this year due to obviously all the COVID crap. Um, uh, Mike Bennett says, "Why do you do it off screen? Because I need to focus. Um, 
uh, because I do it off focus. I could do stuff on screen as well. I could do blind tasting on screen. I, if people would be interested in me watching me do that. Um, but to engage with you requires a little distraction from actually what's in front of me. It, there, there's a skill to be able to engage and interact with y'all and not just get lost in the whiskey. When I'm doing blind tasting, um, the rest of the world does not exist, right? The phone is off. The phone's not even in the same room. Everything's quiet. The rest of the world does not exist. The only thing that exists when I'm doing blind tasting is the wine or the whiskey in front of me, right? I have to focus that much. So doing blind tasting live, there's the distraction of having to pay attention to the audience. Or uh, you could just mute the chat so people could chat and I wouldn't have the fuck to say what they're talking about. But there's also the mental distraction to know that everybody's watching, right? So anyway, all right. So I really like this whiskey. Um, I think it's very, 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 very good. I would like to see more age on it. I think this biggest challenge is going to be on the quality price ratio. Um, let's see how much it costs. About 60 bucks, 60 bucks. Um, that's going to be the challenge. The red breast 12, which I'm going to get to in just a second. Uh, I think it's probably around 55 bucks. Red breast 12, 55 bucks. Yep. 55, 57, 58, 59, and widely available, uh, even at your local grocery store. So it's slightly more expensive. And as we're going to get into it, uh, one hard to beat is uh, the Red Breast 12. Anybody who it, who says, I, I want to try Irish whiskey. I've never tried Irish whiskey. What should I try? I always say Red Breast 12. Red Breast 12. In terms of the quality of the price uh, ratio, quality price ratio, but also in terms of its availability, also as a good ambassador of Irish whiskey, a good representative of Irish whiskey. Try the Red Breast 12. Mike Bennett says, uh, that makes sense. Tech multitasking is hard, but we still want to be part of it. I get it. You know, I might do something that would, if, if they're interested, of course, I get the challenges getting patrons to show up due to scheduling conflicts, but I, I might do it. As I get closer to exam time, I might just start doing that anyway. It actually would be good for the exam because when you take exams, you're going to be nervous, right? I've, I've taken a gazillion of them exams. You always get stressed out. You always get nervous, right? The nerves or stress of doing it live in front of people would somewhat imitate of doing an exam. You know what I mean? To put yourself in that sort of climate, that, that stressful environment. Um, if no one's watching and nobody knows if you screw up, then... You know, then that stress isn't there. So um, it might be actually be good for preparing for exams to actually do it live. But that would be down the road. That would be down the road. To get, and the purpose would for me would be to put me in that more stressful environment. All right. I would really like, I really would like to do more blind tasting with fellow whiskey tubers, uh, particularly Matt over at um, ADHD Whiskey. Um, I, I know he's bourbon focused, but I would like to do blind tasting stuff with him. I would like to do more blind tasting with Daniel Weddington. Uh, he's a busy guy. I'm a busy guy. We're in two different states. But guys who I think are really, really good at, at tasting, giving tasting descriptors. All right. Let's go on to the Red Breast 12. The Red Breast 12, about 55 bucks from Middleton Distillery, bottled at 40% alcohol by volume. Yeah, it's at that minimum. There is a cast strength, right? That is a little higher. The Lustau, I think, is also at 40%. Let me check. Could be a little higher. Let me double check. The Lustau is at 46. The Lustau is at 46%. Middleton Distillery, if you're watching this, let's bump up the let's bump up the 12-year-old to 46. Let's bump up the 12-year-old to 46. At least make it an option. If people don't want a 40%, 46%, they don't have to buy it, but make a 46% available. Let's take it up. 
And tealing, I like one of the things I like about tealing is there a minimum of 46%. All right, let's bump it up a little bit. All right. Now, the question I have is what I smell on this, I have so associated red breast with pot still that when I think pot still, the aromas and flavors that come into my memory is red breast. Consequently, red breast has become the standard. It's become the profile I expect, um, minus you know the various cast finishings. But am I imposing on the category of pot still what I find in red breast? I don't know. I don't know. As there are more pot stills available, we may find that pot still basically has more variation than just what we find in the red breast. It just ha so happens that what the red breast does is uh, really, really good. But sometimes a particular style of wine from a particular region can become so well known that everybody, the reputation of that particular region really hangs on that particular wine producer or same thing with distilleries, right? When people think Isla, they think peat whiskey. They don't, even though there's lots of non-peated whiskeys. When they think Isla, they think peat whiskey. When they think peat whiskey, they think of the Southern three, Lagavulin, Laphroaig, and Ardbeg, even though they're only, you know, one third of all the distilleries on Isla. But the reputation and the connotations of saying Isla, that's generally what you tend to think of. Uh, Mike Bennett says, that is a profound hermeneutical question. <laughs> I got to put that one up there. Uh, most of my audience probably not going to know what that, what that means. Um, <laughs> uh, that is a profound hermeneutical question. Hermeneutics uh, has to do with uh, interpretation. Oops. Uh, hermeneutics, uh, named after the Greek god Hermes, it has to do with interpretation. How do you interpret text? So you have general hermeneutics. You know, how do you interpret the Constitution of the United States? It, and it has to do with understanding its language and the historical context. All right. Um, hermeneutics, how do you interpret a particular whiskey? Uh, I think it's a pretty clever way of looking at it. And we do. We interpret whiskey in light of preconceived ideas. We have our prejudices and preconceived ideas that we bring to the whiskey, but it's also influenced by understanding of the history of the science of the production method and, and, and our personal preferences and experiences and all that, as well as uh, what we had for dinner or whatever. All right. Those all affect our interpretation or understanding of a whiskey. That being said, I think it's become the hallmark. I think the red breast has become the hallmark of Pasto whiskey. It's become what we tend to expect. It's become the standard bearer, not only in terms of quality, but in terms of flavor. Now, a lot of jibber jabber. Let's get into the nose. Baked apple, apple pie, pear, but loaded with cinnamon. And that's why it's apple pie and not just apples. There's that buttery character to it. So I'm making the contents of the inner, the inner parts of an apple pie. And I'm using loads of butter. Cinnamon, nutmeg. Vanilla. Um, I'm not getting a tingle on the nose, being accustomed to... Now, if you only drink beer and you only drink, uh, you know, wine and you, you're having whiskey the first time, this is going to make your nose tingle. But if you're accustomed to, you know, doing whiskeys all the time, and it's not. But 40% not getting a tingle, that gives me an indication of the ABV, that this is under 46%. So if I was going to guess the ABV, I'd go 40, 43, just based on how I'm feeling in the nose. Some of those characteristics you could get from a bourbon cask. You can get vanilla, obviously. Cinnamon, um, you can get from a bourbon cask. I'm not picking up any sort of uh, sherry notes, so not any dried black fruit notes, whereas I was getting a, just a touch of that, just a little bit of that from the tealing.
I'm going to have a whiskey moment here. Amen. All right. That's a whiskey moment. When a whiskey catches your attention and you just got to kind of sit in it, reflect, and just enjoy it. All right. Um, let's see here. Glenn Anderson, 55. Wow. Another one. Thank you very much. Every time a Glenn Cairn rings, an angel earns its wings. I think Powers, John Lane are better than Red Rest 12. As into uh, Irish, it's 46% alcohol by volume. So, I, you know, I could, I could, I, you know, I need to try more Powers. By the way, if you Google uh, Powers, John Lane, the labeling has changed. This is the older labeling. They now have same contents. They have now have a different shaped bottle and a different label. I don't really don't care. The, the new label's okay. It doesn't bother me. Um, I like this one, whatever. I, I need to try some of the other powers, John Lane. This is the 12-year-old um, to become more familiar with it. So this is just a 12-year-old. Have you had the 12-year-old, and are you comparing some other uh, um, powers, John Lane, or what powers, John Lane, are you comparing to the red breast? Uh, that's, I would be my question to you. Out of curiosity um, as to wh what you might be trying. Um, definitely, this is not going to be the last time I do an, a series on Irish whiskey. I do need to wrap this up by the end, by probably early to mid-October. I'm then going to do a series on Texas whiskeys. After that, I'm going to do nothing but scotch for probably the next two years, uh, mostly because I need to focus on exams. Um, so I'll be focusing 100% on scotch primarily just for, for doing exams. So 2021, we'll see the end of focusing on anything other than scotch. For going to 2022, it'll be all scotch. Going into 2023, it'll probably be all scotch. Hopefully with at least one trip back to Scotland for a third trip to Scotland. All right. So even though I haven't gotten in to tonight, the Powers John Lane, but you can see I've killed at least half the bottle. Um, this is a bottle that's easy to kill. Um, this is a bottle, it's easy to grab and pour it. And ding, every time you look at all your whiskeys, you go, what am I gonna grab? Boom, and grab this. Really, 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 really good. Um, Donald Rant says, da -da -da. Uh, I would compare the three swallows. So I've seen that in the story release uh, or the discontinued signature release to Red Breast 12. Thank you very much for the tip. Um, I had this tendency when I start a series, I'm going to do it for a month. Oh, let's try this one. Oh, let's do this one. Oh, let's do this one. Oh, let's. And then the series gets longer and longer and longer and longer. Right. I end up doing it for four months rather than a month. I'm trying not to do that this time. But there are, uh, there's also uh, Kilbagan has released a pot still that I would like to try. There's another one. It begins with a B. There are new kid, new guys on the block for Irish pot still. Um, hold on. And it's really affordable. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, da -da -da -dum, da -da -da -dum. I actually saw, oh, come on. Fairly new. No, my brain's going blank. So K&L in Redwood City has these. Busker, yes. Don't have to rant. Busker, yes. Busker. So that's another one. Uh, it's like under 30 bucks, too, which that alone makes me really, really, really curious. Um, so K&L... Uh, they're in San Francisco, Redwood City, and Los Angeles. They have uh, the Kilbagan, and they have the um, Buskers. It, 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 it's, it'd take me an hour and a half to drive there, and i turn around an hour and a half to get back if I drive at the right time of day. I could have it shipped, so I might do that. I might order one of those and have it shipped up here, but then I have to be here to sign for it. It, it becomes a pain in the ass. Um, the last place I lived, my brother was up with me and he could sign for it 
or I had it actually sent to Walgreens and you can pick it up from Walgreens uh, if, if, you, if they're shipping via FedEx. So I might do it. I might, I'm considering it, but I'm trying to hold myself back from going on and on and on and on. Um, do I have room for it? Currently, I don't have room on my Irish shelf. I would then have to make some adjustments, move the Japanese shelf down, and make room for more Irish. Not opposed to that. I just really, really want to move on to uh, scotch. All right. So, um, score-wise, this is something I'd give over 90 points, depending on my mood, uh, 92. Uh, the tealing, I'd probably go like 88. It's a high, it's a, the development is good. Um, the length of finish, uh, that could use some work. It doesn't necessarily have the breadth and depth and richness of the Red Breast 12. It's that richness of the Red Breast 12 that I really, really, really like, that I really, really like. I, I like that richness. That's the seductive character of the Red Breast 12. Uh, I'd be very, very curious, um, uh, the powers that you mentioned. Uh, does it have that richness that I really, really like in, in, in the red breast. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So if anybody's watching this on the replay and you've not um, had an Irish and you're thinking of buying one, what should I get? Right now, I would say the red breast. The only reason why, even though I really like the John Powers sherry cask, I think the sherry cask, although I very, very, very much like it, I think it's going to be a slight distraction from understanding the category. Uh, it's an intellectual thing. Not a, it's not a palate thing or flavor thing or aroma, flame, uh, aroma thing. It's an intellectual thing. I'm understanding the category. So I would say start with one that rightly reflects the category and what the category has to offer, and then get into the ones in which there's an extra something else. All right, let's go on to the uh, Powers John Lane. We get a little bit of a turn here. I don't believe in shaking whiskeys. I don't believe, I think you exaggerate the alcohol. I just turn it to the side, get the side of the glass uh, wet. So some of my other fellow whiskey tubers that are doing this, it's not freaking wine. Okay, wine is at lower ABV, you know, 12.5 to 14.5 to get the separation of the wine from the esters and so forth, you coat the side of the glass by swirling it, and then you smell it as the bowl, the aromas fill up the bowl of the glass. So this part, but in a wine glass, you don't need to do that with spirits. Don't do it with spirits, all right? Just turn the glass like this. Don't shake it, all right? No shaky, shaky, as Rafi says. So the dried black fruit notes, fig, dates, raisins. There is... I always reminds me of baklava. There is this savory character to it with, with the sweetness character on the nose. There's an earthy character to it. I almost want to say like a sweet tobacco character to it. But the fig dates raisins is there. There is some vanilla, uh, almost like a um, an intense caramel, baking spices. Do I get the buttery character that I get on the red breast and I get a hint of on the tealing or is it completely masked by the sherry cask? Yeah, uh, Grumpy Old Fart says Powers is spicy. Yes, absolutely. It does have um, an intense spicy character to it. I, absolutely, I totally agree on that. that. It does have a spice for character on it. A brown sugar. It's funny because there's actually a tingling in the nose. It's not that an alcohol tingle. It's a spice tingle. Of course, that's enhanced by the alcohol. This is a whiskey. I like the nose so much. I could just continue smelling it. But in a blind taste, and a blind test at this point, I'd be challenged to think it's not a single malt scotch. All right, on the palate. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. 
the texture, the texture. Well, it's the texture that's telling me it's probably that you, you, I'm either going to go a blended whiskey from the texture, soft character of the grain whiskey from a calm still or going to go um, pot still. It doesn't have that multi kick on the back the way the teeming does. Hold on. Even the Redbreast 12 has a little of that malt. You know, that kind of a multi, it's almost, it even has a texture slightly. Uh, gritty is overly strong. Um, like the, like the, of the finest sandpaper of siltiness. So of these three, the, the one with the biggest multi kick to it. So if you like single malts, uh, the teeling, it, it has more of that multi kick to it. The John Powers doesn't have that multi kick. But it's got that real velvety, silky character. So I actually had someone at work the other day ask me for a recommendation for smooth whiskey. And I recommended to this person, well, I would either go with a bourbon, right? And I, of course, I'm, I'm trying to recommend affordable whiskeys, not, not some over 100 bucks, some in the affordable character. Um, and I recommended the Redbreast 12 and a bourbon. I think I uh, might have been a Buffalo Trace because it has to be, they're not going to go hunting for things, right? They're a newbie. It has to be easy to find. It has to be affordable, right? They're not going to spend a ton of money on it, right? So I recommended a Buffalo Trace because I know I can pick them up for $21 or less at a grocery store. And Redbreast is easy to find at a grocery store. I, you get, they have them at Safeways. Right. Um, so I know, hey, in her mind, she can go grocery shopping and pick up a bottle of whiskey while she's at it. So that's what I recommend. So if you like silky smooth, now when most people wouldn't think of smooth, it's a texture, not a flavor. But what they mean is it doesn't have an alcohol bite, right? That newbies, you know, that, that bite of alcohol um, is what they find shocking, right? Um, and so I think the silkiness of mouthfeel of Irish whiskey, of this, of pot still whiskey, it's going to be really, really good. Um, you can, they can, I could lean them towards a blended scotch, you know, but um, I would rather send them towards a bourbon uh, or an Irish whiskey. And I think if someone's a bourbon fan and they don't like the multi character, and I've heard some bourbon people say they tried scotch, they didn't like the maltiness of it, then I would recommend check out Irish whiskey. And check out uh, the single pot still um, because it's going to have that texture that you're familiar with uh, with a bourbon. And try, uh, you might want, and if they like, and if they're already drinking a lot, if, well, if they're already into bourbons, then I would probably go the cast strength uh, because it has a more, little bit more oomph to it. And because bourbons, although there are plenty, there's some bourbons that are aged in sherry cast, it's not part of the mainstream of bourbon characteristics so i would put probably not uh gear them towards the lost style because of that sherry cask influence so i would definitely go uh the red breast uh 12. Mm, 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 mm. so again it's the texture on the powers that tells me um that leans me towards uh irish pot still um, and if, and if I was, if, if we had multiple choice, you know, is this a single malt? Is this a pot still? Is it a blended whiskey or is it, you know, something else, a Japanese whiskey or something like that? It, you know, out of the four, the single malt, I would write off a bourbon or a Japanese whiskey. I would definitely write off. It would be a, because of texture, uh, between the pot still and the blend, I think. And so then the next step is, if you're stuck between those two, can you find something that dis that is very distinctive 
of a pot still that isn't found in a blend. And what I need to do then for blind tasting is compare blends, Irish blends or Scottish blends with pot still to see if I can find what says to me in that whiskey that, hey, I'm a pot still. I'm not a blend. I'm not a blend. So, all righty. So uh, we're a little bit over an hour. Sorry about the muted section. If you're watching this on replay and you realized it was muted I and you kept watching, uh, I apologize. I'm going to put a comment down below uh, that it's muted at one point. Hang in there. Keep advancing. Keep keep watching. So I apologize for that. Hey, shit happens, you know. All righty. So I hope everyone has an absolutely fantastic. Uh, before I go, does anybody have any questions? Uh, but before I head off, if you have any questions, let me know in the chat right away. If you have any questions, comments, let me know uh, in the chat down below on the replay. If you haven't already, uh, give me give this video a thumbs up, give it a like, and if you happen to be watching, you've not yet subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. All righty, so I'm going to take off and hope you have an absolutely fantastic weekend. Hopefully, we're going to get a little bit of rain soon because we need it here in California. We might get some on Sunday, but I'm looking forward to tomorrow getting back out on the uh, road with my bicycle out into the wine country and uh, enjoy what uh, California is known for. And uh, let's go out with a little bit of rock and roll. Sláinte